Cette conférence va maintenant être enregistrée. Ok, so hi again. Uh, this is going to be a lecture on brain computer interfaces, their past, the present, and the future, as I see. And um, this is what we are going to go through today. We are going first to see an introduction, see some background knowledge in case you haven't followed the previous classes, see a brief history of the BCI. Uh, up to 2000, and then see the most recent applications, mostly medical applications of BCI, and then touch a bit on uh, its commercial use, and then see what the challenges are for the future and the promising research and ethical considerations. Um, first things first, I just want to mention that we've seen it in the previous lecture, but just to, just to refresh your memory, that neurons are the, I'm not sure if you can see my, sorry, okay, that the neurons are the basic uh, type, are the main uh, component uh, of the brain. And they make up uh, circuits, uh, circuits and neural networks, as we see here. And the uh, different parts of the brain are associated with different functions. They are not strictly, uh, we cannot strictly assign specific regions to specific functions, but we have an idea what, uh, when we want to do some stuff where we are going to apply our um, experiments. And the main thing uh, for today, which is going to be important for today, is to understand that neurons can be activated, can be active, and when they do so, the, they generate electric signals, like we see here. And uh, those uh, signals can be measured by uh, a lot of devices that we are going to see in a bit and uh, let me just yeah okay so what is a bci a bci is basically a connection between the brain and the computer and uh, it's, a, it's an idea that involves numerous ideas from different fields blended together uh, in order to, to achieve something that efficiently uses the brain signals to, uh, to perform actions using different external devices or effectors as they are called and how bci works first we have the acquisition of brain signals uh, that can be done with different um, with different brain imaging modalities that i'm gonna show you in a bit and then we have the translation of the brain signals into something that the brain can uh, can read the digitalization then we have some signal processing. Basically, we try to characterize the brain signals, uh, see what's interesting uh, among all this data, and then translate what we find interesting into specific actions. And uh, there are many different types, uh, different strategies on how we can control BCI, brain computer interfaces. And uh, one of them is uh, motor imagery, Im Im imagery um, which is basically uh, the imagination of the movement uh, of various uh, body parts. 
uh, which results in the activation of the sensory motor cortex. And uh, in turn, it changes the brain activity. It activates the neurons, basically, as we have seen, uh, measured by uh, our brain imaging mod mod modalities. And uh, another control strategy is uh, neurofeedback uh, for passive BCI designs, which is actually uh, control the BCI based on other bio, biological markers, like how how calm we are or our body temperature or our heart rate or uh, even neurofeedback like what's happening on our brain the the basically sorry the machine can read what's going on in our brain and uh, apply something based on that and then we have the visual evoked potential which uh, is basically uh, neural activity after uh, the subject of, or the participant or the user of the BCI is presented with a type of visual stimuli. And I'm going to just briefly mention some of the main brain imaging techniques we use for BCIs, uh, which is um, first electroencephalography. EEG, which measures the electrical brain signals from the scalp. It's basically a cup of electrodes. Uh, it can it can start from a, a few electrodes and go up to 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 hundreds of electrodes. It has very high temporal resolution, and, and that's why it's so useful in BCI applications because it measures electricity, which is bas basically very fast. <laughs> uh, we can uh, detect brain activity in no time and uh, then decode it and uh, have the BCI do the, do the action. Uh, it has a low spatial resolution, which is uh, not a big problem in sub BCIs, but in others we are going to see that it needs a much higher spatial resolution. And uh, one important thing to mention about EEG is that it can uh, we can either use it with event-related potentials. What uh, what event-related potentials are is basically from the time that the subject or participant is presented with a stimulus, uh, we can basically average over the, uh, over the activity of the brain activity of the subject uh, time locked or centered around the stimulus. Like we see here, for example, we see that we can do the same thing uh, in many trials, then center all the trials above the, based on the, on the time that the stimulus was presented, and then uh, get something that, uh, get something like that. And uh, another important thing to mention, because we are going to see it later, is that um, we get those waveform components. And we name them according to their polarity, negative or positive. And the number represents how many milliseconds after the stimulus um, we see the, the peak. Another thing that many, many brain computer interfaces use, and uh, that's used. Uh, um, uh, usually as a biofeedback, uh, it's brain waves, which tells us basically about this, the overall state of the brain. And the good thing about brain waves is that 
they 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 have individual they have differences based on based on the individual but overall they are pretty consistent so uh, it's it's pretty practical for BCIs. And then we can also have brain computer interfaces using uh, invasive uh, ways of measure brain of measuring brain activity. And uh, we have ECOG, which is basically a grid of electrodes placed directly on the surface of the brain. And uh, we have as implanted electrodes as well which they can be implanted uh, deeper than the ECOG ones and both of them can actually uh, record activity but also stimulate the brain change uh, the brain's activity based on uh, the experimental protocol or the or its use in the brain computer interfaces and uh, another thing to mention basically ECOG uh, has the same type of uh, recordings as the EG but much more much less noisy and much more precise in terms of localization and electrodes can uh, give us information about uh, single neurons as well, like we see here. I'm not sure if it's big enough, uh, but basically we see here that every line is a different neuron and we can have uh, the exact timing uh, it spiked. And that's quite important cause, because uh, we need the brain computer interfaces to be as fast as uh, possible. And uh, yeah, do you have any questions up to now? Or anything that's not clear? Uh, by the way, I, I can't see you, so you probably have to speak. But I know I'm gonna connect through my phone. Uh, okay. So we can now begin to see a brief history of brain computer interfaces. And uh, I'm gonna start. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, I'm gonna start by. Sorry, I keep I keep hearing my voice. Okay, so back to it. Uh, basically, everything started in 1924 when Hans Berger discovered electroencephalography, the brain imaging technique that I just showed you, and uh, he published in German. Um, his findings and uh, we jump 40 years after when uh, Dr. Gray Walter uh, describes the first brain computer interface in 1964 in Bristol and uh, what he actually did uh, he had a patient and uh, he asked him to press a button to advance a slide, proje a slide projector and he recorded the corresponding brain activity. The system was then uh, connected to a slide projector, uh, which was set to advance the slide when a similar brain activity was detected. And what was interesting, it was that the system could move the, um, the arrow before the patient um uh, press the button and uh, the fact that he could control something before 
he actually pressed the button, it's, uh, it's what makes it the, the first PCR. And uh, a fun fact about Grey Walter, he also uh, discovered some uh, small robots, which he called uh, turtles or tortuas, and which were the grandmothers of our little robot, um, uh, the cleaning, cleaning uh, how, how do you call it? The little robot that cleans the surface of our uh, house. It's really, it's really, he's an interesting guy, uh, look, look him up. And then we have uh, Alvin uh, Lucier, who recorded his brain activity and, perf and translated uh, the, his brain waves uh, into something, uh, into music, basically. And uh, yeah, another interesting thing you can look up. It wasn't the best music in my opinion, but uh, he did it. And it was something uh, revolutionizing at the time. And then we have Dr. Jacques uh, Vidal at UCLA uh, in 73, which for the first time publishes uh, something on brain-computer interfaces, and he coins the term brain-computer interfaces. And we can see here that it, it was pretty um, complex, his setup. And then we have uh, in the 1980s, uh, Dr. Apostolos Yorgopoulos, who uh, did intensive research to decode uh, how animal models could, um, to decode animal, the brain activity of animal models. And he was actually able to predict directional movements and uh, from a group of neurons. Actually, we can see here, this is something similar to the, to this thing that I just showed you, to this thing right here. And he actually recorded from groups of neurons, and he could predict uh, if the animal model was going to move his hands um, in any, di any direction. And then we have a group of three scientists uh, who, for the first time, were able to, to control a robot, a physical object, using non-invasive EMG. And uh, the same year, we have a quite big, uh, actually, everything was a big discovery. But we have Dr. Farwell and Donchin, the two um, guys here, who developed the first P300 speller, which is actually a brain-computer interface that allows, uh, allows the subject to type on the screen based on the, on, on its, on the brain waves. And we are going to see more in detail the P300 speller, and uh, it still exists, and it's still uh, on its way to improvement. And then 10 years later, uh, we have Dr. Phil Kennedy, which uh, has a, does an implantation of an electrode on a patient, and uh, the patient is able to compute a, to move a computer cursor. And another fun fact about this guy right here is that uh, a few years ago, he, even though he was uh, healthy, he underwent uh, a, neuro, a neurosurgery in order to implant electrodes on himself and continue. Uh, his research, because he said that his research, his research was going to die if he didn't do it. 
and um, yeah so and then we have i'm sorry i skipped one uh, in 2003, uh, the team Cyberkinetics develops the first commercial BCI, which does something similar with Dr. Phil Kennedy, but this time it's uh, it's applied on um, outside of the lab, and uh, it allows uh, restoration of motor move, of motor ability in patients. And then we have in 2004. Uh, Dr. Nicolellis, uh, which uses a rhesus monkey and succeeds. Uh, let me first explain to you what the monkey did. Um, the monkey could move something on the screen uh, based on its brain signals. However, for the first time, the monkey could the monkey could have could have feedback um, on what it was doing and we call that a closed loop uh, brain computer interface and um, yeah it was groundbreaking i'm not sure i'm not sure if I, i'm completely clear about how brain computer interfaces work so please disrupt me if you if it's not clear okay i'm gonna go on and i'm gonna show you uh, applications of brain computer interface and uh, how they have developed since uh, dr nicolelli's 2004 closed loop brain computer interface and this is exactly how uh, closed loop brain computer interfaces work. It's basically just the traditional brain computer interface I described uh, at the beginning. However, this time we have real time feedback uh, of, of what the brain activity uh, does on the effector. And there's two types of feedback either the, the user sees just sees what uh, what is what is happening or uh, and that's that's exciting or we can stimulate uh, the participant's brain in order to make him or her feel how she or he would feel if he used if he had um, an arm, a hand. I'm gonna show you a, a video. I think it's gonna be much more clear. Oh, how can I? You don't have to pay attention to. Um. Yeah, and we can see the monkey here. I'm not sure it plays on your screens or no. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so basically you can see that the hand that the monkey um, controls can grab uh, the food and uh, get it to, to its mouth. And uh, in this case, the monkey just was just able to see what's going on. That was the kind of feedback it used. And I'm gonna show you another video. This time it's gonna be a human. And this time it's quite different. It's quite 
uh, more advanced because uh, we have a participant that is that cannot move uh, from the shoulders and down and uh, he has implanted electrodes in both hemispheres of the brain of hemispheres of the brain half of the electrodes are implanted on the motor cortex which is the area responsible for movement and half of them are implanted on the sensory cortex which is the area of the brain responsible for sensing stuff so he can control both hands because uh, we have implanted both the both hemispheres and um, he can actually perceive both hands and uh, so there are two goals associated with this BCI. First, read the signals from the motor cortex and perform the actions, and then simulate the feeling that the hands would have otherwise, and uh, communicate it to the participant brain. I'm gonna, again, you don't have to listen to the explanation. You see how he plays with the balls. And another uh, great thing about this um, this brain computer interface is that it can control the hands, but in case the participant wants, okay, this is in a lab uh, setting, but in case it becomes commercialized, it can also connect to other devices other than the hands and control uh, the other devices as well whether it might they are a screen or um, or a cursor or even his house like switch on the lights and stuff like that and we can see him here that he he's at the point where he can control each hand independently and cut a piece of potato, I guess. By the way, we see him moving his hands, but he is paralyzed. He just can he he can just do this little movement. Okay, the cameraman was not that great. Okay, yeah. That was it. Um, and now we return back to the P300 speller. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. So, which is an EEG based, it's it's much less complex than what we have seen with the robotic hands, because now we are just uh, controlling what we type on the screen, and it's it's EEG based, so no need for uh, surgeries. And it's solely, solely based on the P300 signal, the event-related potential that uh, I explained earlier, which is the, brain, the brain's response to surprising and unexpected stimuli. And it uses the oddball paradigm, paradigm, which is basically something very simple, but very useful. 
there are presentations of sequences of repetitive stimuli, and then there's an infrequent or, ir or ir irregular uh, stimulus, uh, which elicits this P300 surprise response. And in this case, the target stimulus, this that the stimulus that's gonna uh, stimulate, uh, that's gonna cause the P300 signal, is light. Uh, it's light on the letter that we want to type. I'm gonna show you the video. I think it's gonna be much more. Uh, And again, we don't need the music. Okay, I cannot turn it off, sorry. And and actually, I, I'm not sure if you can hear me on top of the music. But basically, what do you see here? Because I had the pleasure of uh, working in this team. Uh, we see that each of the letters flashes. The participant concentrates on a single letter. And when the letter, the target letter flashes, the participant, um, the participant's brain actually elicits the P300 response. And what do we see here? Let me point out. Here um, are uh, words based on what was already typed, typed in. So uh, this makes everything much faster, which is the main uh, problem with this kind of brain-computer interfaces. They can detect pretty quite good, pretty well uh, the, the signal, the P300 signal, uh, but uh, we cannot make it very fast. And uh, so the fact that there are words embedded in the in the screen design makes it much uh, faster and uh, and basically here we see the we see it's used in the lab but the actual target audience uh, are locked in patients patients that have a perfectly function functional brain but cannot uh, move their body at all. Uh, they basically they are locked in their own body. And uh, locked in patients are usually patients that uh, have amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is um, a disease, or stroke patients. And uh, yeah. Uh, apart from the speller, the P300 signal, because it's so easy to to cause, uh, it's also used in other applications like gaming and um, to make gaming accessible to to all people, even people that cannot move their hands. And uh, here I have something that it's already applied. Uh, I got it from a, a clinic in Montreal, which is stroke rehabilitation, where the the participant uses motor imagery, motor imagery, which is actually imagining what he needs to do. The system analyzes this brain activity and can determine whether what he thought, what the, the, what the brain's um, activity, whether the brain's activity was correct or not. And if it's correct, uh, the participant can see it on the screen first. 
So it's like seeing himself already doing uh, the stuff. Sorry, I didn't clarify that the participant cannot move the hand. That's the that's the uh, goal to move the hand. And uh, so the participant can see on the screen uh, whether the brain activity uh, was correct or not. And at the same time, he has electrodes placed on his hand. So the, the muscles, the correct muscles are activated. And slowly, slowly the participant learns to uh, elicit the right brain uh, activity for the hand to move. It's a process of learning from real learning, actually, to initiate the movement. And then we have uh, another uh, application. This time, uh, it's uh, Dr. Nicolelli's team. He's actually um, a, lead, a leader in the field of brain-computer interfaces which use a non-invasive brain-computer imaging, so no need for surgery. And uh, since 2014, uh, eight participants that were diagnosed with complete paralysis uh, have, have, been under, have undergone uh, a neurorehabilitation training with an exoskeleton, which is basically, I'm not sure if it's clear, I can start the video so you can see. No, I'm not gonna start it. I wanna wait to tell you what this is about. Um, so basically the participants wear an exoskeleton and train with it. And uh, a few years later, they published the study saying that uh, not only their control of the exoskeleton improved, but actually they, they started having sensations and voluntary muscle control below the level uh, of the spinal cord lesion. For example, if they couldn't move their legs, after using the brain-computer interface, they had improved uh, improved motion uh, without the exoskeleton. So now we are talking not only about assisting the participant uh, in initiating movement, but also um, a kind of uh, therapy uh, that's, uh, that's, that's being used. Actually, here we can see the improvement in their uh, motor abilities. And uh, this is actually quite important because, okay, they might not be able to actually become independent again, but it helps with other uh, health problems associated with uh, paralysis, like hypertension and um, and bladder and, bla and bowel uh, control. And the, their first participant uh, kicked, I don't know how you call it in the football terms, but did the first kick to initiate the World Cup in 2014. Okay, now we seriously don't need to feel this. Um, but basically, that, that's it. Let me. Yeah, okay, we don't need to hear this. And uh, yeah, basically, that was a big uh, moment for the field of brain computer interfaces. And uh, yeah, I mean, okay, it's pretty exciting. I'm not sure if you're excited. I cannot see you or see your faces, but it's exciting. Let me tell you. <laughs> and uh, as a last 
type of medical application of brain computer interfaces. I have deep brain stimulation, which is actually uh, simpler than any, uh, any exoskeleton, and it's been around since uh, more than 20 years, I think. It's mostly used for um, patients with uh, Parkinson's and other tremor-related uh, uh, diseases. And what the main idea is that the, uh, there's a surgery, uh, an electrode is implanted deep in the brain, and the electrode uh, activates or keeps activated the brain region. And uh, there is dramatic and sustained improvements in the motor function of the patient. And I added this uh, little drawing right here. This is the drawing of a spiral, of a spiral of a patient before the surgery and after the surgery. Basically, that was a target uh, spiral. I'm not sure if you can see. Yeah, that was before and that was after. And a spiral was the target. And fun fact about this brain surgery. Uh, the patients are wide awake uh, because the surgeon needs to check that the electrode that he's, he or she, or she is going to uh, implant is not, um, is not altering uh, something other than the structure intended to alter. And another interesting thing about this uh, operation is that sometimes uh, people experience flashbacks during the surgery, and that's what um, inspired research in applying this type of stimulation in Alzheimer's disease. And then as a last step, I added the commercial brain computer interfaces, which um, are quite, um, can get quite diff uh, different uh, uses. Uh, we have the brain gate that I already mentioned, it was a medical application, but we can also have gaming uh, brain computer interfaces where the main idea is getting the player closer to the game, eliminating the game control, and just uh, trying to make the whole experience more immersive. Another thing about commercial BCIs is that since 2016, uh, some group of uh, hobbyists uh, of brain-computer interface uh, started uh, a kit which actually allows everyone to buy uh, something like a, not something like a, a type of, of uh, brain signal measure and a kit to create its to create our own brain computer interface and then we have a brain um, open BCI uh, which um, which is actually a company uh, which does the same thing. Okay, it's not as cost, uh, it doesn't have a low cost as this one, but still it allows everyone that wants to play around with brain computer interfaces uh, buy what it's needed. And there are many uh, open resources about brain computer interfaces. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a field that actually grows very fast. For example, I, I know already two people that want to do brain computer interfaces about gaming. So it's a booming industry. And uh, yeah, or there are, other, there are many other uh, applications of brain computer interfaces outside the lab. Uh, for example, 
uh, Neuroware here uh, designs uh, products and clothes uh, which measure brain activity. Or I've seen some algorithm that uh, shows faces that the participant will find uh, attractive. And uh, as the as this industry is, is booming and is going to continue booming, uh, there are many things that we need to think about before it starts uh, happening. And there are also other stuff that I didn't mention. Sorry again. Uh, th there are uh, brain computer interfaces about education, like to keep you concentrated. I've seen some others that um, you can use in a in a work environment to uh, monitor uh, stress level and concentration in uh, in employees. And uh, yeah, there are many many different applications of brain of brain computer interfaces outside the lab, and it's only starting to be happening. So now I'm gonna talk to you about the future, but first let's take a five minute break and uh, we'll be back. It's 7.53, let's be back here at eight. Not sure if you hear me. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna see you in a bit.
Hello? Is it we're back? Okay, uh, I hope you are back. And uh, this is going to be the last part of, our, of my presentation today. And it's going to be about the challenges, the promising research, and the ethical considerations associated with this um, research. And um, Yes. So I'm going to start with the challenges and it gets a bit technical, so I'm going to be fast. Uh, first, in terms of uh, hardware, the electrodes that uh, the implantable electrodes basically need to be flexible and need to get as flexible and need to get as small as possible. And if, um, and if they are implantable, they should also resist the corrosion uh, that they will undergo, undergo uh, in the brain. And uh, they should also have a, a large surface, but not a big size which is it's kind of tricky to, um, uh, to accomplish. And um, yeah, I keep, um, I keep thinking if what I'm saying makes sense to you, but I'm gonna go on. And uh, basically what, what I'm trying to say is that the electrode, the thing we use to measure the brain's activity, needs to be as small as possible to be inserted into the brain and it also needs to have a large surface area in order to be able to record from a large large area around it and it also needs to be flexible so it doesn't uh, destroy uh, the brain and it can, by being flexible we are also flexible in where to put it in where to place it actually and then the chips um, the things that uh, convert the small electrical signals into something that the computer can uh, read um, uh, need to have a high performance, uh, but they need to consume uh, as less as uh, le as low power as possible, so they can be implantable. And um, so they don't need to be charged all the time. Then we need the whole thing, the electrode and the chip and the whole mechanism to be uh, hermetically uh, packaged, meaning that it, it needs to be in as uh, low contact with the brain tissue as possible because um, it can destroy it through time and the fact that we need we it's going to be we are talking about electrode implants that are going to be kept on the brain for a long time uh, makes it necessary for the materials that are going to be used to be biocompatible and then when we have achieved all this the neurosurgery part has to be taken care of because uh, as the electrodes are, are getting smaller and smaller and more flexible, 
it's going to be harder for a human hand to to manage them so we would eventually go into robotic surgery and uh, yeah some companies actually claim that uh, they can implant uh, through just a small hole on the skull and uh, insert the electrodes using robot it's actually for the moment it's actually done in uh, academic labs and then we have uh, the software part um, which is actually getting the brain signals into computer signals and then taking those computer signals and uh, processing them as efficiently as possible in as uh, low in in no time basically uh, and uh, translate it into actions and um, apart from apart from the fact that already the brain data is quite complex apart from the fact that as time passes we are uh, we are measure we are recording more and more cells and more and more data uh, those algorithms need to be as fast as possible and need to be flexible in terms of like i've um, i've showed you the uh, the research team that developed the hands the robotic hands but they could actually connect other devices as well uh, if we are going to implant electrodes to someone they need to be flexible as well in case we need to apply them in other devices as well and now that i talked about the, the that research team i remember that i've seen in the chat leila's question which was about uh, whether they could feel let me find the question sorry uh, yeah whether they could feel as if they had uh, hands and basically the answer to this is as a first step, step they try to control the hands using brain signals but even if they did even if they accomplish that, uh, the, the user is actually using a hand uh, with no sensation. It, uh, unless he's seeing the hand, he cannot tell what's going on. And um, by what they are trying to do is uh, having a hand with sensors and according to the sensor, like for example, if you touch something that's, uh, uh, if you touch something at this uh, location, they should, they aim basically to send a signal to the brain that says exactly that, that there is something in this particular location right here and you are touching it. So, uh, basically it's not as if you had a, a hand but it's much better than not having any sensation of what's going on with the hand you control and i hope it's clear and uh, yeah i'm gonna get back to it, this thing so these are the brain computer interface challenges in terms of technical stuff and other than that, uh, we should also include in the in the equation the fact that we need to take into consideration who the the user is going to be and how usable it is. Like for example, we've seen those uh, uh, those uh, research teams working on exoskeletons and uh, robot hands and all that but you should also take into consideration how the patient feels how usable it is outside the lab and uh, another thing that 
And maybe it's not as true for uh, those who are paralyzed, but it's true for um, the P300 speller, for example, which is going to be used by people that are locked in. We should take into consideration the patient's environment. And by environment, I I not only I don't mean only the house he is in. I mean the people as well, like uh, the people uh, in the environment of the patient should have a say on how brain-computer interfaces are um, developed in order for them to make it uh, for them to make it easier as well. For one example that I didn't include in the presentation, but I can think of it now, is for example, one way to personalize the 300 speller is actually take all the words that are suggested here and um, adapt the word data set uh, using the words that are going to be needed by the patient. And I hope this is quite clear. And uh, yeah, yeah. So this is these are the brain content challenges from the perspective of technical stuff and from the perspective of uh, user satisfaction. And uh, I'm going to present you some ideas that have not yet been implemented, but they are on their way and they are quite promising. The first one is uh, this passive brain computer interface. And by passive, I mean that, um, that we use the brain computer interface not to control something explicitly. <clears throat> Like, I'm not going to use it to raise a hand or communicate with someone, but based on my brain's uh, activity, the brain computer interface can do something. And in this case, we, we are seeing an idea of applying brain computer interface to uh, as a break in cars. And what this actually does, I'm sorry. <laughs> it, uh, it activates the car's brakes before the, the muscle, the motor, um, uh, the motor action is, uh, is, in, is initiated. And basically this uh, results in uh, braking much faster, actually not much faster, but in the case of car accidents, even the even milliseconds count, especially in the case where the where, when you are going fast. And uh, yeah, this is an idea of big brain. Uh, another quite interesting thing, uh, uh, quite exciting thing, is what we call, what it's, what we call neural dust. And uh, basically what this is, is a very, very small uh, device, which operate, uh, operates as a nerve sensor. It's powered by ultrasound. So no need for wires, no need to, for chargers or anything like that. And it exploits the fact that ultrasound can pass through most of our tissue quite easily. And uh, yeah, so it gets power from um, ultrasound and it, it we can place it somewhere in the brain and have real time information about uh, about neural activity. So we have very high spatial tempo, spatial resolution and very high temporal resolution. And we can actually measure a bunch of stuff like uh, 
pressure and temperature and oxygen levels and things like that. And uh, the company that develops, actually it's not a company, it's a lab, it's a lab associated with a company, projects that they can make this even smaller and uh, they can actually, they have actually created something that does the same thing but can stimulate the brain as well. And uh, yeah, that's something that's, got, that's gonna change stuff. For the moment, it's only applied on uh, animal models, but if everything goes uh, right, um, it's going to be applied on humans as well. And uh, yeah, ah, I couldn't present you brain computer interfaces without touching on Neuralink, Elon, Elon Musk's uh, startup, uh, claiming that can, uh, can connect the brain to the internet. And basically, um, I, I included it here because it, uh, it's a nice uh, transition to talking about augmented, co augmented cognition and how brain-computer interfaces can help us become uh, more powerful in terms of cognition. It, this augmented cognition can come in many flavors. It, uh, it might mean uh, bigger memory. Uh, it might mean that um, indeed we are connected to the internet. Uh, it might mean that we can actually recall stuff much more efficiently than we do now. And uh, uh, or we do things much faster than we do now. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the idea. Uh, that's the idea. And basically Neuralink's idea, it's uploading and downloading. No, actually that's not the Neuralink's idea. That's, that's what Elon Musk claimed at the, at the point that we can actually upload and download our thoughts, which Currently, it's impossible, but uh, we might be able to do many stuff uh, in the next few decades. And the and Neuralink, actually, the big uh, contribution to the field is that they designed the first uh, implant. It's not yet uh, applied onto people. That, that records from much higher number of electrodes than we do right now. And so we have much more data and uh, supposedly much more uh, precision in terms of what we can do. And uh, yeah, they also say that they can connect the brain to many different interfaces. Like they, uh, you can connect your brain to a keyboard or your phone or a computer and uh, or any application or stuff like that. And I'm not saying that it's impossible. I'm just saying that for the moment, that's uh, not possible for the moment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but augmented cognition, it's a subject in, uh, it's a, it's a hot topic in the brain computer interface, uh, field. And another interesting thing, uh, I'm, I'm gonna show you today, probably the last, is this monkey brain net and brain to brain communication. And uh, again, uh, Dr. Nicole Ellis's team, designed this experiment where three monkeys, uh, they record the activity from three monkeys, three monkeys' brain, brains, in order to move a virtual hand. So one monkey controls the 
x-axis, the other the y-axis, and the other the z-axis. And uh, interestingly, they succeed in doing so. And even more, even more importantly, uh, as they do so, they they improve in doing so. And that's another interesting thing uh, about brain-computer interfaces. Again, we are uh, we are not close to doing this stuff on humans or doing this stuff for more complex tasks, but it's something quite interesting in the field. Uh, feels like a movie or something. And uh, it actually, another thing to think about that is that we can use our brain and through the use of internet, for example, we can also um, control things. Excuse me, someone needs to say something. I can hear stuff. <laughs> Uh, let me know if the noise is not clear. Uh, okay. So, uh, yeah, I was talking about the mind invention. Okay, now we are good, I think. Okay, yeah. Sorry about that. And uh, yeah, and this, uh, it's a good transition into the ethical considerations we need to have before uh, welcoming brain computer interfaces into our everyday life. Uh, I'm going to present to you four main ethical considerations that have been uh, proposed by field experts. And the first one is privacy. And uh, you have to imagine that you have to imagine a scenario where brain computer interfaces are widely used. And this might be the case in uh, in the next few decades. What are we gonna do with all the data that we are gonna collect from them? Because essentially, for the brain computer interfaces to work, they need to collect neural data, and they can save them as well. And those data can be used to make algorithms. Uh, for example, like the the ones we are really familiar with that uh, are used to target um, for targeted ads. Imagine how powerful uh, this can get if uh, if a company has data about how we feel and uh, what do we pay attention to. And uh, imagine, for example, scrolling through an online uh, retail website like Amazon and uh, having data showing how you feel about a particular product in real time. Or it can, uh, can be also used by insurance premiums. Uh, it can be used by, uh, by algorithms that match Part, potential partners and stuff like that. And neural data can be actually very powerful. And uh, we need to think about how we are going to protect ourselves from all these uh, data powered uh, algorithms. And one uh, suggestion is the right to keep our neural data private. And uh, even if we choose to not keep them private, we should have the option of opting out 
uh, at any given moment, the data that, are, that uh, is saved needs to be protected and uh, explicit consent should be given in order to use the data and uh, there should be a clear specification of who will use the data and for what purposes and for how long. Because uh, imagine that uh, even though I might opt out from uh, giving out my neural data, uh, somebody else, uh, if everything, everybody else da, does not, uh, the, the data-driven algorithms can apply to me quite, um, quite well. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm being clear again, but I'm gonna use different words. What I, what I wanna say is that if somebody wants to target me as a potential audience using neural data even though he or she might not have my own neural data he or she might have uh, neural data from people similar if i may say in terms of the demographics at least to me so uh, i'm gonna be targeted as well so uh, we should give consent about that too, and we should restrict the centralized processing of this data and uh, ensure that at any given moment we can turn them on and off. And uh, yeah, um, also there are many different things that I gave you examples that, okay, I mean, the, bigger, the biggest harm will be me buying uh, stuff, but they can be used for many different uh, things. Uh, like, for example, um, they, they can open up the possibility of manipulating different people and even manipulating uh, the people's experience. If we t if we if we are up to a point that we are connected to a brain computer interface that can alter our brain state, and then another thing that I wanted to mention as a consideration is the the question of agency and identity, and uh, neural technologies can disrupt our sense of identity and agency uh, as well as the nature of the self and personal responsibility basically they can alter the idea of who we are and i'm not i'm not talking about anything too extreme here like uh, fantasy movies or anything but uh, for example, I showed you a few slides ago the deep brain stimulation, the procedures, the procedure used for in Parkinson's and tremor-related diseases, and some people reported that um, after undergoing deep brain stimulation, they had an after sense of agency and identity. The um, and it's basically something that it's a shake to the core, having something in your brain and not being sure if that's actually you or something else that changes your brain. And another situation that I came across is a, a man who used a brain, stimu a brain stimulator to toggle his, his depression for a long time. And at some point, he wasn't sure if his behavior uh, was was inf was based on who he really was, or if it was a result of this stimulation. And I I included his exact words right here. 
uh, so to to protect ourselves from this uh, from this situation, we should we should protect the right to be educated about those possible effects of neurotechnologies. Because right now, for example, if you go to the hospital and have a DBS surgery, most of the side effects that you are going to learn about is about biological and physical side effects. Uh, how dangerous uh, might or might not be a surgery or not, but you are not explicitly uh, warned that you might face those uh, questions about yourself at some point. And it's, it, I'm not saying that DBS is not safe. I'm just saying that this is a possibility because DBS is actually quite safe and it's widely used for some time now. And uh, at least in tremor related diseases. And um, also the sense of identity can be quite blurred if we are able to control devices that are not in the same place as we are, or if we, as I showed you before, the brain net, if we start to collaborate or have brain-to-brain -brain communication with other people. So we should protect our identity and agency as a human right. And I'm not, I'm saying, I'm talking about legal uh, reforms, not, uh, not something else. And we should adapt, adapt the law and prohibit which actions can be done and which cannot. And uh, yeah, uh, there's another question about agency uh, related to what I just mentioned is, if we get to a point where we cannot distinguish between human and machine, uh, we might have uh, issues with responsibility. Who is responsible about what action? And I know this might sound a bit like fantasy, but, uh, but I'm not talking about I don't know, I'm not talking about something really into something really sci-fi or something. I'm just talking about something that alters your brain just a bit to make you feel like you are not responsible for your own actions. And then another thing, uh, quite important, I must say, uh, that you should think about before developing more neurotechnologies and basically any other type of technology that gives us power and uh, uh, privileges, uh, we should think that technology should privilege, should privilege all the groups uh, equally and not harm some groups. And uh, such biases can become embedded in neural devices. And uh, again, I'm not talking about something very extreme like, I don't know, a brain-computer interface that connects to your brain and, uh, I don't know, distract anyone who has a different brain or something like that. I'm just saying that, uh, okay, one idea that comes to mind is, for example, that right now there are many data being collected about possible uh, treatments of diseases and optimal uh, clinical decisions that should be taken in the in the case where somebody gets sick and uh, so if this data is collected from uh, a specific population let's say it's collected only from from men uh, then those, then the resulting algorithm will be beneficial, will be much more beneficial, potentially much more beneficial to men than any other um, demographic. And uh, this is something that already happens, uh, the data collection and 
from who we collect the data and on who we apply those uh, the technologies that, that we develop. So this whole idea, this whole problem can be applied to neurotechnologies as well. For example, think, let me find an example in, uh, in the BCI uh, uh, situation. For example, imagine having a brain-computer interface uh, that helps you concentrate, but the algorithm that takes the, brain, the brain's activity and turns, the, turns into stimulation has only been um, has only been trained or has only been trained on a specific population of uh, I don't know a specific population then it's gonna be much more beneficial for the population on which uh, the data from which the data were collected than any other population and this can lead into biases and inequalities. So what uh, we might suggest to tackle this is first, the probable user groups should have an input from the very first moment of the design of the algorithms and hardware. The biases should be addressed from the very first moment of the research. And there should be ongoing public discussions and debates about those, uh, those biases. And uh, another thing quite important in, um, in all the technological fields is that advances in technology should be um, an effort of many different experts, including humanists and social scientists, and um, and people that whose whose first uh, whose primary focus is uh, doing is avoiding any inequalities uh, from the, that might be caused due to the neurotechnology. And uh, yeah, st still. I think the academic and research field is quite narrow and uh, how can I say it? And uh, it's 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 a structure that it's not the most um, not all people are represented equally in the academic field still still so it's something that you should take into consideration and the very last ethical consideration that i want to touch uh, is augmentation and again neurotechnologies uh, can enable our mental capacities to go beyond the human uh, limits so uh, we should first control this augmentation the levels that we can uh, we can get to and we should also uh, make sure that everyone has access to it and this relates to my previous point about uh, biases and discrimination so we should uh, define how how neural augmentation can uh, can be used and uh, ah and another thing uh, this whole augmentation idea uh, is has been funded by by organizations associated with the army and uh, i'm not saying that this is necessarily bad I'm just saying that augmented cognition, in my opinion, you you can uh, you can disagree if you want, should not be used for uh, military purposes, or if they are gonna be used, they should be very 
carefully regulated. And uh, yeah, we should uh, we should open this discussion about neurotechnologies because it's something that really uh, that that's gonna change our future. And even though we don't really see it, we still don't really see it around us. It's something that in my, I think it's gonna change in the next few in the next decade, let's say. Yeah, and uh, that was all the ethical considerations that I could think of, but I'm pretty sure that there are others too. So if you if you wanna add something, please do so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna end this presentation. And um, yeah, there are other questions as well, like uh, mind reading or uh, mind control. Okay, this I touched a bit and uh, how ethical it is to have experiments on of brain computer interfaces that are not perfected yet on uh, humans and uh, other questions that again uh, if the main point is that we should open this debate and uh, do it as soon as possible but i'm going to end this presentation uh, giving you some resources in case I inspired you to spend some time uh, on brain computer interfaces. And this is a talk about gaming and brain computer interfaces. This is weekly events uh, about brain computer interfaces. Okay, this gets quite technical, but why not? And this is uh, Dr. Miguel Nicolelis talking about his research. And uh, yeah, you should go watch him. And I think I should have mentioned it earlier, but uh, he does a great introduction in brain computer interfaces. So you could skip this class, but all right, you, you are still here. And this is a forum on the future of privacy. And this is my email. So if you have any questions that I haven't, uh, um, that might arise after this class, feel free to contact me. And I also need to give you a small note that this was a presentation that didn't touch at all in brain, in brain signal processing and uh, the whole field of algorithms on how to translate brain signals into actions of a device and this is again a huge field and people uh, actually focus on this stuff for their whole lives and it's basically one of the aspects of brain computer interfaces that it's gonna change them uh, quite radically and that was it from me today. I am going to share my presentation and the references as well with you. And, um, in case you are, you are already on the mailing list, we are going to mail them to you. Or you can also, well, you can send me an email as well in order for me to have your email if you are not subscribed to us. And this presentation was recorded, so it's gonna be on YouTube soon. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. And let me check if you have any questions. Right here. Okay, I see the chat. Okay, that's it. So I have to say thank you night. very much. Thank you. And uh, okay. Bye bye everyone. I'm gonna stop the recording.